debate yesterday. I don't know if anybody, uh, the, the rest of you saw it, it was about whether the Olympics should be applied for from Norway for the Olympics in 2022, of course the Winter Olympics. And uh, as we deal with the sport and event management here, of course <coughs> this problem is interesting, okay, and uh, the debate was related to whether we should apply or not, okay. As you probably know, many Western countries have or should we say the interest from Western countries to host Olympic Games seems to be going down. At least for these Winter Olympics in 2022, there were actually several candidates early in the process. <coughs> Munich in Germany was a candidate. A Ukrainian city was a candidate. Of course, Ukraine is somewhat special now. So I assume they resigned due to the political problems. I don't know whether you have anything to add our Russian friend here on Russian politics. We don't uh, spend time on that, do we? Uh, 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 okay. Uh, and there has been a growing research on these Olympic Games, as you <coughs> may or may not know, whether they are kind of economically, socially profitable, and most experts seem to agree that they are not, okay? In the, in the sense that what you actually can measure here, related to increased tourism, related to more tourists, more sales from shops, more overnights in hotels and that kind of stuff that you would expect to be. It seems to be much lower than the kind of traditional estimates. So most experts seem to agree today that hosting uh, Olympic Games is not directly measurable, economically profitable. Of course, what you can't measure here is kind of what happens to the people, okay? Some people get happy. On the other hand, there are some people who, who get unhappy, who are not interested in sports, okay? They don't like all these tourists coming into their town, uh, making the prices go up, making the queues bigger in front of the beer cranes and so on, okay? So there are two parts here. Uh, but uh, in general, I would expect that, at least in Norway, most people, uh, at least many people, are interested in sports. So you would expect that there is a certain benefit here that you really uh, it's, it's really hard to measure. Of course, then the question kind of remains, could these benefits be high enough to kind of cover this whole thing? On the other hand, uh, if you look at Norway, of course, we have been extremely lucky. We have found some uh, oil out there in that and that and that direction. Of course, uh, I haven't uh, worked uh, one minute with getting this oil up and selling it in the market, but still there is a lot of money which kind of I am able to get my hands on in a way, being a Norwegian. And uh, in that perspective, so there is so much uh, bad money use anyway, so why don't use it in on the Olympics? That's kind of my argument here. But uh, I'm in the min minority among, among those so-called experts here, I think. Uh, most uh, serious economists doing this big uh, investment analysis kind of thing, cost-benefit analysis, they call it. Um, I think maybe we will talk a little bit about this later in the course. There is certain methods you use to kind of try to measure these. Those of you who are working on the event management course, we kind of get closer into this when you go to this Swiss trip, because this German professor who will accompany you, he's kind of a real expert on these, these topics. So instead of me saying something wrong, he might as well say all the right things at this directly. That's m much more efficient. Okay. But uh, still my prediction is that there will be an Olympics in Norway in 2022 because it seems like those who actually <coughs> should make the decisions, which decision, which are the politicians, it seems there is a certain majority in the parliament. This is not a referendum kind of thing. It will not be decided by the people. And of course, uh, Monica asks, how can you uh, defend uh, to start something which only the politicians want, but that the people don't want? Of course, the argument from the politicians is that we look back and the previous Olympics we had in 94 at Lillehammer, the situation was even worse then. Even fewer people wanted Olympics then before the Olympics, but everybody wanted it afterwards. But as I, as I said, the reason for that was, of course, that Norway performed extremely well in those Olympics, being the best nation. And of course, that has something to do with what kind of experience people get. So this is kind of an uncertain project, okay, depending on how the hosting country actually performs in the Olympics. But the most empirical analysis seems to indicate that 
the hosting country does unexpectedly well in their own Olympics because <coughs> there is a great push up to increase performance before the Olympics and everybody starts training eight years before so the Norwegians who would perform in the in the <coughs> those Olympics in 2022 now it's 2014 this is eight years isn't it they are perhaps only 10 years now 9 10 11 years old of course they have a certain period then to prepare and using the right drugs or whatever they need to to get in shape to to take all these gold medals and uh, but as I said my prediction is that it, it still it will end up with us hosting it there's also been a political debate here as I said we see kind of these Western countries backing off but these big uh, should we say Eastern countries uh, there are still two other competitors with Norway for 2022 one is China the other is Kazakhstan I think of course I, sh I shall not speak evil about neither China or Kazakhstan but they are not typical Western nations neither culturally nor economically so there, there are major differences here and there is this kind of argument in Norway that in these big uh, other type of states it's it's easier for, for politicians to kind of make these decisions in a sense okay but uh, as I say we are trying to do exactly the same here I, at least I that's my prediction okay now the next point is chapter three uh, of course it's always it's, it's not possible to talk about sport or event management without touching politics okay you understand that that this is something we have to keep in mind so even if we are, we are kind of from different countries with different cultural backgrounds as well as diffi difficult both perhaps religious as well as political views we kind of have to be able to express our thoughts here and, uh, if you don't then it, this will be kind of rubbish so if you feel that I'm arrogant or impertinent related to your culture please tell me okay I'll try not to be that okay uh, then we move to uh, the lecture folder again and uh, open up uh, chapter 3 Isabella it was yeah now it came to me and you from Spain no no you from you from Spain from Sa Sa uh, the, the Santiago de Compostela what was it again your name was Nailia, yeah. Okay. You see, it comes back. <coughs> okay. Chapter three is about consumer behavior. That means how consumers behave. Okay. And but that's actually not what the aim of this chapter is. The aim of this chapter is to kind of build a logic argument from the start which ends up with a <coughs> demand curve. Kay, that's the idea. <coughs> Start a logic argument, introducing some assumptions about ho how consumers behave when it comes to buying goods. And based on those assumptions and some greed, we kind of end up, after a fairly long discussion, I would say, with demand curves. So we're trying to argue now, logically, for a case that these demand curves actually could exist in the real world so to speak remember I, I talked a little bit about this didn't I when we kind of started because in a sense the first two chapters here are kind of more or less telling the whole story not all but most of the important part of how to deal with a, a perfectly competitive equilibrium but uh, there is some holes here in kind of um, arguing for uh, not why a demand curve is going downwards <coughs> we did that okay but uh, does it exist under which assumptions can we assume that these demand curves exists how do we move from a single customer to a group of customers into a market this kind of stuff okay we need, we need to need to discuss this and that is the topic of chapter three but before we move into chapter three, uh, let us look at uh, an event, sport event related example where we actually try to apply this general equilibrium model to make a point, okay? 
So what do you think about this? big salaries that these famous football players have. Do they earn too much money, do you think? You think so? Yeah. Uh, what was your name again? Kato. Kato, yeah, you are from uh, from Stavanger, was it? Yeah. yeah. So you think that uh, these big players earn too much money? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think so. You don't, don't think so? No. You think they earn too little? Yeah. Or actually, uh, so okay. yeah, yeah, it's okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So then the question, uh, of course, if you think about should we say important professions like a medical doctor at the hospital who could save lives? Of course, he doesn't earn anything close to this Lionel Messi or whatever the names are. Not. And as you probably know, the entertainment business has payoffs even higher than the football <coughs> players, doesn't it? Yeah. We have these best selling authors, for instance, who may even earn more than these football players. Some of these Hollywood actors may earn more. So it seems like there is something peculiar about this entertainment industry when it comes to salaries. But we also know, don't we, that there is very few of these football players and authors and actors who earn this big money. Most of them earn nothing, don't they? We have all heard these stories, haven't we, about these promising actors all over the United States, moving to Hollywood, trying to get a role in a film, and they have to do everything to, to do that. Of course, normally they all are working in bars, aren't they? Waiting for the big shot to come. Of course, in that case, they don't earn anything, er earn anything on their acting, do they? So there is a kind of, um, should we say, very unfair uh, division of money here, isn't it? Those who are kind of... Um, Hitting the spot, they earn extreme amounts, those are not, earn nothing. Uh, and of course, this is not uh, random. This, there is an explanation for this. And given that we believe that these markets are close enough to a perfectly competitive market, which I do not, by the way, I do not do believe that, but uh, given that we, for the argument, believe that, then we can try to use perfectly competi competitive equilibrium model to try to explain why it is like this. Okay, so let's start. Let's think about two groups of people. We can think about football players and let's say these football players <coughs> are very good, okay? So we talk about players who could uh, easily enter a team in Premier League or wherever, okay? Of course there is a certain demand for the services these players provide, isn't it? There's a certain willingness to pay among, among cons consumers to see Lionel Ples Messi play football. We know that, okay? I don't know whether you know the ticket prices on Nou Camp in Barcelona. Maybe you from Spain can help us. Have you ever been to a football match in Barcelona? Um, Do you know the prices? Around 70 euros. 70 euros. Seventy euros, that's the lowest price I would expect, and then it's kind of so seventy euros that is around around five hundred Norwegian crowns, roughly. Do you know what it costs to go to the stadium here? Some of you were here. I, I paid sixty crowns. So you see there's a there is a slight difference, which of course it should be. Higher the price, the better the quality. Okay. Uh, that was kind of a sidestep. But uh, the argument here is that there is a certain demand here, obviously. The, the, there's clubs paying for them, paying their salaries, and there's people out there covering the costs for the clubs. So there is something, and probably the, it looks like this, okay? But if we compare now this demand of football players with, let's say, another profession, let's say medical doctors, then, then we would expect, wouldn't we, that the demand for these doctors should be on top here. Meaning that. Um, the uh, consumers here, for a given amount of football player or doctor, would be willing to pay more. Okay, uh, this is what this means, isn't it? When we take the demand curve up, then for a given amount, there is a higher price in the market. So the, the market is willing to to pay more <laughs> in salaries. So that is kind of what we expect, isn't it? There should be a lot of professions, not only medical doctors, maybe teachers, kindergartens, nurses, and so on, that. Uh, 
is more interesting to use money on than on watching football matches. Okay, this is kind of the image you get when we do this. Okay, that's kind of what we describe. And that seems reasonable, doesn't it? But of course, now we know that these guys up here, whether they are doctors, nurses over there, they don't have that payment, do they? Like these top footballers. So to, to be able to arrive at this, they have to explain it through the supply curve. That's the idea. Okay. Now, I is it hard to become a doctor? Yeah. It is. Yeah. You think it's harder to become a doctor than reaching the level of Lionel Messi? <coughs> now, I think that's the point here. Okay. To become a really good football player, there's just a tiny amount of people that are able to be that. Okay. Maybe just one out of 100,000. Of course, if you look at 100,000 people, I would expect maybe a 1,000 of those could be reasonably good doctors. If you think about nurses, maybe all of them could be, okay? Being a nurse is perhaps not that tricky. You need some common sense. You need to be able to learn how to do a shot and do some take up. Yeah, I don't know these medical terms, but you, you see my point, okay? So even though the demand here is high, we can think, uh, and the supply curve kind of tells us how expensive it is to produce these kind of uh, abilities. So if it's relatively easy to produce doctors or nurses, then of course the supply curve should be like this, okay? It doesn't cost kind of more to get more of these into the market. But these football play players, they should perhaps be like this then, okay? And, and here is the point then, isn't it? Even though the demand here is higher, the intersecting point here, or the market equilibrium, this is, by the way, a labor market model, isn't it? We have kind of wages here, and we have quantity here. The wage plays the role <laughs> of the price of the product here. Then we get the price here, don't you? So this is the wage for the doctor. Even though the demand is lower here, of course, then we arrive at this point, which intersects with the supply for footballers, and here is the supply for doctors. This point is on top of this point. This is the positive wage difference. So we, this model kind of tells us that we, we should expect that top football players should earn more money than doctors and probably should earn more money than most other agents, given that we accept these <coughs> supply curves. So you see, you can't use them all here, obviously. I think that's, obvi that, that's kind of obvious, is it? So, but, but you see, this is kind of one way of using a general equilibrium model to kind of explain, okay, then it's perhaps correct as Kelly says, they don't want to deserve these guys. It's so hard to become a very good football player that the scarcity of football players makes their wages very high. But of course the problem here is that these markets are not perfectly competitive markets. Okay, they are far from being that, as we discussed briefly last time. So, so in principle, this model isn't right. It's actually very wrong. But still, it produces a, s a sensible answer. Okay. Just an example to tell you what we can do with these models. Okay. Then we're moving into more boring territory, consumer behavior. The main task for the chapter is to answer the following question. How can a customer with a limited income decide which goods and services to buy? And we answer this question through three steps. Step one, there we look at what we refer to as consumer preferences. In step two, we introduce budget constraints. And in step three, we kind of look at, based on this preference structure we assume, as well as budget constraints, how will then a rational or actually greedy consumer act? That's the idea. Okay, now we start making some assumptions here. Uh, there are actually three of them here. One is referred to as completeness. Number two is referred to as transitivity. And number three, I call greed, or optimizing behavior, <coughs> if you like. Uh, it's the same here. Completeness here says the following. And if you see the sign between A and B, it's read like preferred. 
So either A is preferred to B, or B is preferred to A, or A is and B are indifferent. So this sign here means indifferent. And that means that the consumer is kind of not able to make a decision. It doesn't matter what whether he chooses A or B. This seems reasonable, or does it not seem reasonable? This is something we now assume about how a consumer actually makes decisions. Okay, so either he would like A instead of B, or he would like B instead of A, or he is not able to make up his mind. That kind of covers every option, doesn't it? Do you agree? Does that seem reasonable? It's always okay. the case, I think. Hmm? What did you say? I think it's always the case. It's always the case. Mm. Okay. Now there are actually is a little bit debate about this as well, but uh, we don't okay. perhaps not <laughs> to dig into the deeper philosophical uh, aspects here. The second one says that if I prefer a red Ferrari over a green Volkswagen, and I prefer a green Volkswagen over an old Lada, then I should also prefer the Ferrari if compared to the Lada. That's what it says. It seems reasonable, doesn't it? So if A <coughs> is preferred in front of B, and B is in preferred in front of C, then it should of course be logically that A also is preferred over C. And then finally, we assume that consumers are greedy. This is perhaps a more tricky assumption, isn't it? Of course, as, it, as it's listed here, you, you, you get the choice. Either I put 100 crowns here or 50 crowns here. I assume most of you would choose the 100 crowns, wouldn't you? Or would, that, uh, uh, would some of you choose to get 50? Uh, this seems kind of obvious, isn't it? That uh, if you're given the choice of choosing between two amounts of money, you pick the highest one. But it's not that simple, is it? Now suppose we change the numbers here and <coughs> say that, okay, it's not 100 Norwegian kron, it's 100 billion Norwegian kron. Versus, you can either get this, or you can get one, okay? Let's suppose I gave you this option. Of course, given that you're playing greed, you would say, yes, oh, how nice you are, you're saving my life, okay? On the other hand, maybe some of you would start thinking, where does this money come from? What kind of consequences does it have if I get this money? Maybe it could have consequences for other people, friends, family, whatever, okay? So, it's, it's not given, and some would say that, uh, starting to think like this, then of course we run into deeper philosophical areas, and. Uh, and then it kind of gets complex. The idea with this course is, of course, to accept this, okay? Given this, then we can derive certain things. That is uh, more or less what how economic theory works. But uh, obviously we can discuss a lot of stuff here, but uh, I, I don't see much point in spending too much time in discussing the philosophical aspects of these three assumptions, or maybe you can call it axioms, or uh, something we kind of need to, to, to progress. <laughs> At the bottom here, there is a question. It says, what would happen if all consumers had identical preferences? So all consumers kind of mean all human beings on the earth now, okay? So if everybody wanted to buy exactly the same, what would happen then, do you think? Now, if everybody wanted to buy a Ferrari, of course, they needed to earn enough money to do it. But what would happen to the other car manufacturers? Yeah? The lot time would drop. Yes. They would go bankruptcy. They would have to stop. And if everybody wanted to eat bananas, then, of course, all the apple producers and plum producers and bread producers would have to stop. So what kind of long-term consequences would we foresee with this kind of world? If you do it just one dimensional, of course, then uh, everything apart from that one dimension would vanish, okay? So there would be nothing left than Ferraris, 
clumps uh, let's say uh, black suits and uh, whatever we need okay what would happen happen to progress and development yes no there will be no competition but is it any point to kind of do research to get further <coughs> of course if you're happy with the Ferrari you have why should you produce a better Ferrari so given that you have a constant and given an equal preferences the world economy will collapse okay there wouldn't be any world economy so all progress all change would stop so of course if this happened in the Stone Age we would still be in the Stone Age, wouldn't we? Everybody's happy with uh, the stones we have, so uh, <laughs> we keep on uh, interchanging these stones if, if necessary. So you see, in order to, to see development and involvement in, in any kind of population, different preferences is kind of necessary. And a lot of human beings seem to have problems with both accepting as well as understanding that people are different. This is the major human problem, isn't it? This is why we have divorces, why we have crime, why we have war. So all kind of bad things are linked to this concept of different preferences, isn't it? Because if everybody agreed with Adolf Hitler, we wouldn't have the Second World War, would we? So you see, this is a kind of duality, okay? We need these different preferences to change ourselves. It's kind of underlying an evolutionary process, okay? But uh, at the same time, it is our major problem. So if you think there is somebody up there who's kind of constructed this, it seems kind of ingenious in a way. On the other hand, it also creates a lot of problems. So we wouldn't like a world where everybody had equal preferences. So we need that everybody has, or ne not necessarily everybody, but a reasonable amount of persons or consumers want to buy different stuff. Of course, this is not static, it changes. So 10 years ago, it was only 2% who wanted a Mac. Now it's maybe 7%, 10 years, maybe 30. <coughs> what, what do we know? Okay. But there is differences in preferences. It kind of opens up for competition and makes things kind of evolve and change. So this is extremely important, I think, to, to kind of get this feeling. And if you start getting interested in economic theory, then you start to accept this. And, uh, and my opinion, it's, it's a kind of a, a sensible way of addressing life. Because if you can accept that other people have other opinions than you, then it's much easier to travel through life in general. Okay? You don't start... A lot of people say, why don't you like pork? Okay? I don't like pork. I say, well, that's so good. Why don't you like that? What do you care? I say, because it's none of your business. Okay, the point that I don't like pork is good for the world economy, and then I can take all this story. Okay, but it takes too much time. No. So, uh, in my opinion, this is uh, important to both uh, economically and practically in many instances. Okay. Now, here's a slide which has the title "Market Baskets or Bundles," and. Uh, let me explain what we look at here. Here we look at an example uh, where we look at two different products. Okay, here we have one product which is food, and here we have another product which is clothing. Okay, these are kind of necessities in most cultures. You need to have food to not die of hunger, and uh, if you don't have clothes, at least in Norway, you will freeze to death. Okay, so these are important. We need to have both these two at the same time. And then what we look at here is that we, we look at different combinations. So we can kind of think of a basket here where we, we have kind of uh, a, a, a combination we call A, which contains consists of 20 units of food and 30 units of clothing. And then we have another bundle kind of put together where there's less food but more clothing. And then we have one here which has more food and less clothing than those two and here is one where it's a little bit less food and a little bit more clothing and so on and we can uh, make a graph like this where you kind of uh, put up these points can't we so these 20 30 points you should be a black dot on this uh, this uh, 
graph. Do we see it? There is food here, 20, 30. So this A point is, of course, the first A point. So we can plot these points then, can we? G and H has 10 units of food. So we could go up to G and H. And B should also have 10 units of food, which is has. Okay, so all these points here, B, H, A, G, E, and D, can be simply plotted. Of course, for any combination here, we kind of span the whole area here, don't we? If we look at all possible combinations. Now the question is, can we say something in general about consumer preferences if we look at this figure? And we can, can't we? Given that people are greedy, we can immediately say that this point is worse than this point. Because in this point, you get 10 points of food, and 20, or maybe not points, yeah, 20 units of food. But in this point, you also get 10, but you get, it should be 40 perhaps, H. Yeah, it should be 40. This point should be slightly longer down here. It's a little typographical error in the textbook. So if you're greedy, any line upwards here, you, kind of you can kind of take these out, can't you? given that you're greedy. The same if you go in this direction, you agree? D is better than G. So D would be preferred by any consumer who is greedy over, over G. And if you move in this direction, the same happens, doesn't it? Because if you move in between here, in this direction, you get more of both. On the line, you get more of one, keeping the other constant up in this direction. So you said A is better than G. E is better than A. But if you are to decide between B, A, and D, you can't make a decision here directly, can you? Then you have to say something about the trade-off in between these two bundles. What, how much food would a certain consumer be willing to give up for getting a unit of clothes? So greed kind of rules out certain bundles, but not all of them. Okay, here is a slide containing indifference, indifference curves and maps. So to the left here is an indifference curve, to the right here is an indifference map, meaning that we have more than one indifference curve drawn in the same diagram. That's the difference there. So what is an indifference curve? If you see this red curve here, it goes through point D, point A, and point B. And the <coughs> meaning of it is that the consumer should be indifferent in between A, sorry, B, A, and D, meaning that the utility or his, should we say, wants for these <coughs> three points are exactly the same. So an indifference curve is a curve which could be drawn, <coughs> at least theoretically, stating that a certain consumer doesn't care whether he is in any of the points on this curve. If you look here, you see there's a U1 here. The idea here is that we should kind of be able to transform these tra preferences into numbers. It could be money or whatever, that's really not the point here. And we have a certain name on these numbers in economic theory, we call them utilities. So utility kind of measures the amount of satisfaction that consumers get by consuming different stuff. And it's kind of a, a numerical number. The higher it is, the more satisfied the consumer is. Of course, on this indifference curve, the satisfaction level is the same. So here we have a certain level. Based on our previous arguments that we argued that D was this E point was better than A, if we draw an indifference curve through this point, it should be higher utility or higher satisfaction for the consumer. So if we move to a map here, it contains kind of different utilities, U1, U2, U3. U3 is bigger than U2, U2 is bigger than U1, and it kind of corresponds to a given satisfaction level, which increases as you move from one indifference curve to another for a given consumer. The assumption here then is that, is that given this way of thinking, we can perhaps achieve 
or find out how a certain consumer can decide on how much to buy of one thing versus another thing. Okay. Shape of indifference curves. In the same way as the mon curves must kind of be going like this, indifference curves must also go like this. It's kind of easy to see it, isn't it? Because if you look at, look at this alternative way of writing it, drawing it in this manner, then you end up with the point x here, which has more than y on this axis and more than y on the other axis. And of course, then you're not indifferent, given that you're greedy. Okay? So these indifference curves, they must be kind of shaped like this. They must be downward falling. Uh, and there is certain arguments that could be made that they should kind of go like this as well. So uh, they must kind of look like the Mon curves. They are not the Mon curves, by the way. But there is a logical reason for it that, that this greed assumption kind of rules out these other ways of drawing the curves. You see the point? It says here the greed assumption as x provides more of good a and b than y in difference between x and y or y and x is impossible. You can't be in difference between this point and this point, nor this point and this point, or any point in between here. So, now we have introduced this concept of indifference curve, which kind of tells us that any consumer is neither more happy nor more unhappy as he moves along this indifference curve. <coughs> and we have also argued that the shape of this indifference curve should be something like this. It should be sloping downwards from the left to the right. If we have a diagram as we have here, then we have one good along one axis and another good along the other axis. So these goods could be food or clothing, as in the example. It could be anything other than that. Of course, in real life, consumers do not choose between two products or two goods. There are a whole pile of different things to choose among. So in reality, this is kind of a multi-dimensional thing, isn't it? We can choose cars or that type or that type or that type. We can choose food or that. And so there's a lot of, uh, of dimensions here which we kind of boil down into a kind of essential structure here. And that is typically what we do a lot in economic theory. We kind of make extreme simplifications to try, but still to try to grasp the point. And the point at least we get out of this is that this, this way or drawing an indifference curve is not sensible based on our assumptions. So it should not look like this. It must look in some way like this. If we move along this line, we can think of kind of some extremes of different indifference curves. They have names in uh, microeconomic theory. The left kind of thing is called perfect substitutes. You hear they actually put some real examples here. They have orange juice on one axis and apple <coughs> juice on the other axis. These other category of indifference curves are referred to as perfect complements. And here we have right shoes and left shoes. Let's start on the left here. A perfect complement is a kind of good which it doesn't have no value to increase without increasing another good at the same time. So if you only drink coffee with milk, then it doesn't help you to get more black coffee, does it? Then you also need more milk to get more satisfaction. These kind of indifference curves arrives in those situations. Of course, right shoes and left shoes is another example, isn't it? Do we know any other products in has this structure, which are complements? Yes, Skis and bindings. Skis and bindings is a very good example, isn't it? Unless you use the skis for something else than skiing. If you use them as wood, for instance, then you don't need the bindings, okay? Any other examples? Cars and tires. Cars and tires, yes. Cars and motors, yes. Cars and batteries, yes. Of course, within one product, there is a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, complements, isn't it? Everything within. You, you don't need a computer without a screen. These things has to be there. So within a car, you normally don't buy a car without tires, do you? So, so this would be a kind of artificial example. Do you see my point? I, it's correct, but it's kind of artificial because it's within a given <coughs> product. 
I'm looking for some other stuff. A hot dog and bread, is that? No, not necessarily, okay? <laughs> some people like bread, some people like hot dogs, and some people like both, okay? Uh, mustard and ketchup, no. In some cases you need both, in other cases you don't. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, very creative uh, example, uh, Kelly. Maybe you are talking about Russian politicians, I don't know. Uh, you're talking about all politicians, don't all you? Politicians. Yeah, all politicians. Everyone. Do you agree on that? Uh, the problem is, of course, that we don't buy politicians, so maybe we do that. <laughs> maybe that's the whole problem, isn't it? But in general, we don't perhaps look at politicians as goods, which we kind of... Even though we vote for them, so uh, uh, an interesting example, interesting example. So you see the point. See, there are certain products that have this ability that if you increase in one dimension, it doesn't kind of increase your utility. Of course, you, you constantly, you have to move out one step to get more, or both to get more utility. The utility is the same on the different scale. The other extreme, then it doesn't matter what you get, does it? of these two goods, you're kind of, you're not <coughs> indifferent on the number, but given that you get one more of the other versus one more of the other, it doesn't really make any difference for you. So this, this example of orange juice versus apple juice is uh, perhaps not a very good example. Do you have any better examples? Any suggestions? Products which it really doesn't matter whether you get the one, one or the other products. Do we have any? Now, if you drive a car, sometimes you have to go to a, car, a gas station and fill petrol. Do you care what kind of petrol you fill into? You do. Ah, oh. does it really matter? I never knew. Of course, given that you stick to the right one, then I assume. So we stick. Now, we, now I have a '95 lead-free car. Does it matter whether I buy a mobile or PBP? Or does that matter? Is it different? I don't know. Maybe it is. I have never cared about that. <laughs> as long as the price is the same, I don't care, okay? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my car doesn't like uh, petrol from British Petroleum, but it likes that oil. I'm not sure. I, I tried both. It seems to behave the same. Uh, that, that's a different example, okay? But on on so-called substitute. Substitute means that you can put in one or take the other, it doesn't really matter. That's substitution, okay? Substitution, complement. <coughs> now you see perhaps that these kind of <coughs> indifference curves, they, they make some kind of extreme cases, don't they? The first indifference curve we, 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 we drew was like this, and then you can have this, or then you can have this. So there's this kind of figure here, this triangle where you can kind of put all should we say more normal indifference curve within, but this is, you can't have it outside these triangles, so to speak, uh, formed by this one and this one. They kind of, the outer extremes here. So within this imaginary triangle, these indifference curves must lie, so to speak. Uh, as it says in the text here, in A, Bob views orange juice and apple juice as perfect substitution substitutes. It's always indifferent between a glass of one and a glass of the other. Okay. That's the better choice. In B, Jane views left shoe and right shoe as a perfect complement. An additional left shoe gives her no extra satisfaction <coughs> unless she also obtains the matching right shoe, which seems reasonable. Yes? No, that wouldn't give you unsatisfaction. I, if the alternative is to have nothing, then it doesn't really matter for you whether you get only left shoe. But you're. Like if I have one of left and right, that would be okay. But yeah. if I have two left and one right, then you're here. Yeah. And if you have two left and one right, then you're here. Yeah. So, so it does. Give me more unsatisfaction if I have one. Left oh, yeah, I see. Mm. So you get unhappy because you don't have the other. 
So you're actually more unhappy in this point than you're in this point. Yeah. But that's you. <laughs> Isn't it? Because you can throw away the other shoe, can't you? Well, it was like, it's a good shoe. I wasn't happy. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you refuse. You're difficult. <laughs> uh, let's take a break and we can uh, return to that question later on. Good question, by the way. 